Well, good morning, everybody. We better find our seats or we'll run out of time because we have a long-winded preacher, <laughs> at least one. <laughs> no, name, no names tied to that. So that's the way it's going to be. Well, I'm, I may be talking about that's, myself. That's how we're doing this. No, right? I'm, I'm talking about myself here. <laughs> I, you just happen to be standing up here at the wrong time, brother. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pass the clipboards. If you've been in this class before, you know how this works. Let's pass these straight back in each section. Don't cross sections, please. Uh, that way they hopefully won't get lost. Try to make them all, make sure they get all the way to the back of your section. We, it really is important that we get a good uh, count. Thank you. If your name is not on there, please write it in. I think we had uh, a lot of folks may have not gotten a chance to get registered. <clears throat> so uh, if you weren't registered, your name's not on the list. And if your name's not on the list, doesn't mean you're not welcome. You are welcome. But we would like you to put your name on there so we can make sure and update that list and know that you're here. All right. If you would like to go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Genesis, every Baptist can find Genesis. We'll, we'll start at the beginning. It's a good place to start. That's right. Good place to start. So as I'm sure all of you know, we are starting a new semester today. And this new semester is, uh, we are focusing on Israel in the Bible. After the attacks of, in October in Israel, it's been in the news and uh, a lot of conversation uh, has, uh, has sprouted from that, and a lot of curiosity, a lot of folks uh, talking about Bible prophecy and all that sort of thing. And just, just so you know, we're not into the sensationalism <laughs> here uh, in this class. That's not what we're about. But what we do want to do is we want to be grounded in God's Word. And, uh, and, and hopefully we try to do that in everything. But with all that's going on, Pastor Sam uh, called me and said, you know, what do you think about this idea? And I mean, that sounds great, that we would just help our folks to stay grounded in God's Word. What does the Bible say? What does God's Word say about Israel? And how can we have a, uh, a biblical, Christ-honoring perspective on all that's going on in the world uh, especially what's going on in the Middle East. So that's really our focus. Now, uh, we've passed out papers, and, and you should have one sheet that's just printed on both sides, and, and separate from that, a sheet, uh, a, a pack of six pages uh, stapled together. So if, you're, if you didn't get one of those, raise your hands, and some of, some of the nice folks who you did not get one, does anybody have some extras laying around? There's some right here. Now, that's the single ones. We have some, do we have some more uh, of the little booklets, <laughs> basically, we could share? I printed off 150 uh, just to try to make sure we had enough, and I'm not, because we didn't, but uh, well, we didn't quite have that many registered, so... This is one of the reasons why it's important to, uh, to register for the class. And if you don't get registered for the class, to, to put your name on the sign-up sheet. Because then we have an accurate record of how much uh, material we need to have on Sunday morning if we're going to hand anything out. Now, while we're getting those distributed, I'll just familiarize you with it. The first sheet, the single sheet, is the syllabus, just basically describing... Uh, what we're doing. Uh, we, are, we are focusing on, as I said, Israel in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, it's supposed to say 2 and 3. Sorry, my, uh, my secretary made a mistake there. <laughs> and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you, all the families of the earth 
shall be blessed. This promise was given to who? Abraham, by God. Yes, Abram. Abram. Yeah, he wasn't Abraham yet, that's right. But he became Abraham. But it was given to Abram, and it was God's promise to, to bless him, and through him, bless all the families of the earth. And he blessed all the families of the earth through his descendant, Abraham's descendant, Jesus Christ. And he continues to do that. Um, and it's my prayer, and I know Pastor Sam's prayer, that we would all be prepared as anything like this happens in our lives, when with what's going on in Israel or anything else, and we would all be prepared to point people to Jesus Christ. That is our desire. Uh, Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. You know, these types of events can cause conversations that polarize people. Uh, people can side with Israel to the point of alienating folks who may be concerned about what's happening to the Palestinians. People can side with the Palestinians and, and just absolutely hate anything that has to do with Israel. And these polarizations can distract us from what God is doing. They can distract us from the main purpose that God has given us, which is to share Christ. And I believe this, this, this verse of Scripture is so pertinent for this situation because it's easy for us to, because we're Christians, and because we want to bless the descendants of Abraham, to almost become argumentative or hateful to people who don't see things the same way we do. And folks, this, is, this has got to all be about Jesus. It's got to all be about Jesus. This is an opportunity to point people to Christ. Amen. So what we've done in this class, this is the Bible overview class, and what we've been doing for the past few years since we've, been, since we've had this class is we usually take a passage of Scripture or a large portion of Scripture, and we're doing an overview of that. Uh, this is an overview, really, of all of Scripture. We're starting in Genesis, and we'll go all the way to Revelation. And so, uh, I'm not going to ask you to read, uh, in 18 weeks, read through the entire Bible. Although, if you want to do that, that's perfectly fine. We will not chastise you in any way. But we do have a reading plan that will be passages of Scripture that will go along with what we're teaching. And what we've done in the past is if you'll turn on that second page of this single sheet, it has the, leading, uh, the reading plan. Today is January 7th, and the introduction is the promise begins. Now, you're not going to be able to, unless you want to go home this afternoon and read chapter 3 through 11, which wouldn't, wouldn't be bad. That wouldn't be hard to do, a Genesis. Uh, those, that is the, the scripture that will go along with what we're talking about today. But as you follow along, so for next week, the lesson for next week, if you'll Focus on chapter 12 through 23 of Genesis. That will help kind of prepare you for that. Now, there may be verses of Scripture that we refer to or places we refer to other than that in the Bible, but that'll kind of give you a reading plan to go along with the lesson plan. So that's the way it's laid out. What you see straight across from the lesson is what you should read the week prior to the lesson. Does that make sense? This means yes? Okay, great. Just making sure. All right, so... Let's turn to the uh, lesson on the top of the page where it says, Introduction, the promise begins. Now, I always like to start off and ask the Lord to lead us. So let's just, let's just go ahead and take a moment and pray and ask for His blessing. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You, Father, that You are the only God. You are sovereign over all. Even when there's turmoil that we don't understand, there's injustice in the world. 
There's injustice in this conflict in the Middle East on both sides. But Father, you're still in control. And Lord, we trust you. And we pray, Lord, not only for today's lesson, but for this next 18 weeks that it would honor you, that it would lift up Jesus, that it would not only point all of us to Christ, but it would help us to be prepared to point others to Christ as we engage in conversations, as we have opportunities to speak to people, as we see people conflicted about what's going on in the Middle East. Lord, I pray that Jesus would be preeminent in our conversations and in our thoughts. And Father, I pray that you would guide everything said and done, that you'd be glorified, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so the big question. The big question is, what in the world is God doing in and through Israel? Uh, That's really what we uh, advertised that we were going to talk about, right? We talk about what's the Bible say about Israel, and we, but what is God doing? In order to address that, we need to look at the beginning. Uh, It's like the sister said earlier, it's a good place to start, back in Genesis, and, uh, and some of this is Christianity 101, what we're starting out with. But it's important that we remind ourselves of what God has done. So in Genesis chapter 1, it's right here in your notes, verse 27 through 31, says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, created, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over everything that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. And you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth and everything that has breath of the breath of life. I have given green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So God created everything in six days. And we know he rested on the seventh day. But what was his assessment of what he had created? When he looked at it, what did he say? It was very good. It was very good. There was nothing wrong with what God created. It was perfect. But we know that uh, something happened, right? If you look in your Bible, Genesis chapter 2, we know that uh, God breathed this breath of life into Adam, and chapter 2 kind of zooms in on the creation of man, and he created man perfectly, put him in a perfect environment, but man sinned. If you look at chapter 2, verse 15, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 15, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So man had one command given to him. Don't eat of this tree. And of course, we all know what happened. (laughs) They ate of the tree. Uh, Eve was deceived. She gave to her husband, Adam, and he ate. And when he ate, he introduced sin into the race. He became a sinner. But all who have come from him are also sinners, as Paul tells us in Romans 5.12 here in your, te- in your uh, notes, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through, through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. So, God created a perfect environment. He gave man everything that he needed, but man chose to sin. And you and I are born sinners. We practice sin by our own choice, and because of that, we have death in this world. In Genesis chapter 3 is where the fall takes place. Again, Christianity 101, we're all familiar with this 
story. Uh, Eve eats of the fruit. She gives it to Adam. He eats of the fruit. And then they try to hide from God. They make fig leaves to cover themselves because they realized they were naked. And God calls to Adam and has this interaction with Adam. And he pronounces judgment on each one of the individuals involved in all of what's happened. But I want you to notice what he says specifically to the serpent in chapter 3, verse, beginning in verse 14. It says, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is what we call the first gospel. So what did God say to this serpent? Notice what he said. He said he would put enmity between the serpent's offspring and between Whose offspring? The woman's. The woman's offspring. If you read through Scripture, and, uh, you know, we all love to read the begats, don't we? So-and-so begat, so-and-so begat. That's my favorite. I do that for devotions in the morning. Is read the begats. But if you notice in the begats, is it the, the man or the woman that are typically named? It's the man. The man begat so-and-so and begat so-and-so. And it's, it, the, the name is pra- passed down through the man. But it's interesting, this is the, the, the offspring, or the King James said, the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman. And Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin, the virgin, shall conceive and bear a son. And shall call his name Emmanuel. Jesus is that that offspring of the woman. Born of a virgin. And then he says, this seed of the woman shall bruise your what? Shall bruise your head. He shall bruise your head. Which is a, a, a deadly wound. He shall bruise your head. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Christ, likewise partook of the same things. He partook of flesh and blood that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Jesus became human. He came to this earth. And became one of us so that he could identify with us. And that, so that through his death on the cross, he would crush the head of the serpent. He would destroy Satan. That's what he did on the cross. But you, he said to the, Satan, to the serpent, to Satan, you shall bruise his what? His heel. And the heel of our Lord Jesus Christ was bruised as he was nailed to the cross. Psalm twenty-two, sixteen says, For dogs come encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. So Jesus was executed in a way on the cross that would bruise his heel. And he would die, but he would rise again. But in his death, he crushed the serpent's head. That's the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. That's the gospel. All the way back in the the garden, God had a plan. Man rebelled against God. God gave him one command. One command. And he disobeyed it. And he brought sin into the race. But God, in His mercy and grace, immediately, immediately spoke the gospel into the situation. We know that God made coats of skins 
for Adam and Eve because their feeble ability, their feeble attempt to try to cover their nakedness through fig leaves just wasn't going to cut it. But in order to make those coats of skins, God had to slay an animal. And so blood was shed for the first time because of the sin of man. And it was a foreshadowing of the blood that would be shed by Jesus Christ. If you ever want to know what God's up to, folks, this is the main thing that God's up to. Redemption and restoration. Right from the beginning, God had a plan. This is the first gospel. So, Genesis chapter 3, man sins and is expelled from the garden. Chapter 4, we have the first murder. Firstborn son, Cain, made an offering to God that was not accepted by God, and he looked at his brother, and his brother's offering to God was accepted. The New Testament tells us that Abel's offering was made by faith, and it was a more excellent offering than Cain's. But instead of Cain dealing with the sin in his own heart, he murdered his brother. God didn't kill Cain. As a matter of fact, he he protected Cain, and and that was used as an excuse many generations later by his descendant Lamech, who killed a young man and said, In verse 24 of chapter 4, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. Justifying his own sin. And so the results of sin, the consequences of sin, just continue to increase. Isn't that the way sin is? My wife and I were talking about this past week the devastation of cancer. It's that word none of us wants to hear when we go to the doctor. We never want to hear that diagnosis and how terrible that is. Uh, Doris Cat, as many of you know, recently passed from cancer. I don't know if you know or not, but in, in 21, she had breast cancer. She was treated for that. And everything was looking good. But then when she became ill, they didn't really know what was going on, and eventually it showed up in a scan that it had come back, and so often it does. And it, it struck me that cancer is such an illustration of sin. Sin is so subtle sometimes, but it doesn't stay that way, and it is deadly. It grows within our body, sometimes even when we don't realize it's happening. It grows within our lives. If we're not careful, it's got to be killed. It's got to be cut out. It has to be eradicated. But sin that was introduced by Adam in the garden continued to grow. You can see it throughout the book of Genesis. It continues to get worse. But even though it does, God's promise also continues. If you look in chapter 4, verse 25, it says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh, At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Eve, certainly remembering what God had said to the serpent about the seed of the woman, was looking. Obviously, her heart was broken over the loss of her son, but she was looking for another one to come. And when Seth came, she was joyful and said, God had appointed this offspring. God had appointed him. He was not the one to be promised in the future, but God was going to bring that one through his line. And it was at the time when Seth's son Enosh was born, it says, 
that people began to call on the name of the Lord. If you look down in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and named the man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Adam, that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. 105 years. So Seth was born 130 years after Adam was created. And 105 years later, he had Enosh. And when he had Enosh, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So 135 years after Adam was created, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And God was blessing and continuing his promise through this line of Seth. So one of Seth's descendants was Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Looking down in chapter 5, verse 21, it says, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, and he had sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. Hebrews 11.5 tells us that Enoch was taken up by God by faith. Enoch was a man who walked with God by faith. So God's promise continued through this line of Seth. And then a few generations later, Noah was born. Look down in verse 28. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son. And called his name Noah. Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Now, Noah in Hebrew sounds like the word in Hebrew for relief. And Lamech was saying when this son was born, Noah that he would bring them relief. And what is he looking at for relief from? From the work and from the painful toil of our hands. Why do men have work and painful toil from their hands? Because of sin. That was what God said to Adam, right? So throughout all these generations, it has been passed down that there would be one that would come that would redeem them from the consequences of sin. And they've been looking for that one. And Lamech spoke thinking that Noah would be that one. That Noah was the one who would bring relief. So he named him Noah. Well, Noah's certainly part of God's plan. And he's part of the lineage He's part of what God's doing, but he's not the fulfillment of that. But we know God used Noah mightily. Chapters 6 through 8 tell us about the flood and how God uh, found favor, or Noah found favor in, in God's sight. And God told him to build the ark and bring his family into the ark, and they were saved. And the ark is, a, of course, a picture of Christ, and they were, they were saved, and the entire world was destroyed by the flood. And then we get to Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, beginning in verse 18 there. It says, The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah and from these, the people of the whole earth were dispersed. 
So all the people of the earth were dispersed from these three men, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham, you remember the story, Noah drank a little too much wine, got drunk, was exposed in his tent. Ham walks in and sees his father, goes out and tells his brothers about it. And they go in backwards with a cloak and they cover their, brother, cover their father to, to uh, honor him. And when Noah awoke, he spoke a curse against, against Ham. And he blessed Japheth and Shem. But if you'll notice in that passage, let me get there. (laughs) In Genesis chapter 9, verse 24, it says, When Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his youngest son had done what had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. And let Canaan be his servant. Now he blessed both Shem and Japheth, but he makes mention of the God of Shem. The God of Shem. Shem was the one who was chosen to continue the promise. If you have heard the term, you know, I'm sure you have, a Semite or anti-Semite or anti-Semitism, Semite comes from Shem. And so when someone is an anti-Semite, we think of them as being against Jewish people, but it goes all the way back to Shem. He's the one through whom the promise would come, Shem. And so when we get to chapter 10, it tells us about the uh, generations of Noah and the families, the clans that came from that. When we get to chapter 11, we talk about the, the Tower of Babel, when all these communities got together and they decided they would, they would build a tower to heaven and God confounded their language and they separated according to these languages. And then we get to chapter 12. And in chapter 12, we're introduced to a man named Abraham. So let's go to chapter 12 in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you, make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now we've just kind of taken a, uh, we've covered a lot of years in the book of Genesis. We've taken a whirlwind tour through all of this. But as we've done that, I want you to just kind of think back a little bit to what we've talked about concerning this promise. Remember, the promise began in Genesis 3.15, when God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel." And we said that was the first gospel. We talked about how that is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God was providing a way of redemption all the way back immediately when sin had just happened. And then we went to Genesis chapter 4. In verse 25 it says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For For she said... God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And then when we get to Genesis chapter 5, Lamech says about his son Noah, out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, 
This one shall bring us relief from all our work, from the painful toil of our hands. And then, of course, the one we just read in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Now, you turn to the next page. What do you notice? What are some of the things you notice about each of these different passages about God's promise? What, just, just tell me, what do you notice? Anything, about any of them. It dealt with sin. God had a plan to deal with sin. Anything else? Restoration. God had a plan to restore what had been lost. Anything else? There's a promised one. There's this theme of a promised one all the way through. This one that is promised, there's a, it's linked to the offspring in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 15, the offspring of the woman. And then when you get to chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 25, she has a child and she's excited about this child who has come because she's been anticipating this offspring, this child that was promised. And then Noah has a son. It's, he's offspring. There's a child. There's hope when this child comes. Then Abram, who's promised, uh, he's going to make him a, a, a great nation. He's going he's to bless all the families of the earth through him. Anything else that you notice? How about, who was God speaking to in each one of these cases? Genesis 3.15. Who is God speaking to or through? He's speaking to the serpent, Right? Speaking to the serpent, who was he speaking about? The seed of a woman. He's speaking about Jesus. Who was he speaking to or through in chapter 4? It was Eve. It was Eve and she was voicing, the, the woman voicing this hope that she had in her heart based on what she'd heard God say to the serpent. Because she knew she was going to have, the woman was going to have an offspring. And there was hope in that offspring. And then later it's, it's a man, Lamech. Lamech, who is a descendant from who? From Adam and then Seth. And Lamech has been looking for a hope as well. He's, he's weary of all the the difficulty of life, the toil, and he's looking for relief. And he sees in this son, this Noah, a promise, relief, relief from the consequences of sin. Uh, anything significant about any of these people? Well, I, I would just say, I think it's interesting that the first two References to the promise have to do with a woman. And it was a virgin woman who gave birth to Jesus, born of a woman, as Paul says in Galatians. Are there any similarities or differences that you see in reference to God's promises? Do you see any, any differences between Genesis 3.15 and the ones that follow? Do you get a little more information as you go along? And God starts out with not quite as much information, and then more information is, is added with time. And that's the way God works throughout the Scripture. He gives us a little more information and a little more information, and it becomes a little more detailed. Even with Abram, when he first speaks to Abram in chapter 12, he gives him some information. But throughout the life of Abram, he gets more and more information that there's going to be this promised one that comes. And then how does that promised one come? Who does he come through? He's, gonna, he's, he's not going to come through Hagar <laughs> bearing him. He's going to come through Sarah. So God refines it as time goes along. Well, let's, let's turn over to this last page. 
We're going to see over these next 18 weeks or so, well, 18 weeks, that this promise of God, this promise that began all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, this promise of God continues from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, and then it goes on through Jacob's son Judah, one of the 12 sons, through the tribe of Judah, and then it goes to a shepherd king named David, and the promise continues to be given more and more information. The promise is going to be that it, he comes through the lineage of David, and then Jesus Christ is born. And he comes and he lives a perfect and sinless life. He goes to the cross, he dies for our sins, he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven. But God is still at work. He's still bringing people to himself. And he gives us the promise that this same Jesus who went up into heaven will come again in the same way. And so as, as we are looking at all of this, we must realize that Jesus is the plan. It's all about Jesus. What God is doing in Israel is nothing new. God is still working out his plan to bring people to himself. And ultimately, he will destroy the enemy completely. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says, And the devil who, were, who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented night and day forever. He will completely crush his head. He destroyed his work on the cross and he will completely destroy him in the end. So what is God doing in Israel? He's accomplishing his plan. He is still at work today. He is still redeeming people to his name. And so as we go through this next 18 weeks, I hope that we will keep that our focus, that it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for your goodness, your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of terrible rebellion in the garden, when you had given our father, Adam, everything he needed, you had given him a perfect environment, he consciously rebelled against your single command. But Father, you in such great love and mercy began at that very moment to provide a way of salvation, a way of redemption, and Lord, you're still about doing that today. There are so many things in our world today that can distract us from that important point. We can get wrapped up in political conversations. We can get wrapped up in all types of opinions. We can allow social media to, to capture our minds and take us down a path that we, we don't need to go down. Father, I pray that you would help us to be a people who keep as central in our hearts the Lord Jesus Christ and the fact that you are continuing to work out your plan. You chose your people Israel, not just because of them. You chose them to use them to reveal yourself to the world. And Father, we pray that you would continue to do that for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.